Continuing our discussion of legacy effects, it's important to note that while we often focus on the physical built environment, the infrastructure, there's also a social or human benefit, and that is the development of human capital, the skills that individuals gain and develop through a mega event. Bidding and running a mega event often demands new skills that are developed by individuals and organizations, specifically around the management of events and people, managing infrastructure, mass transit systems. Often a mega event will require multiple language skills to be employed in managing a facility or an event. Firms and organizations are drawn into different legal and international agreements as part of the mega event. The host city and country will develop its marketing skills to reach out to a global audience and also develop the ability to manage tourism and to enhance the visiting and experience of tourists to the mega event. As part of this development, there's often the need for institutions, government and business to develop new capacities. This could be changing the way things are done, creating new institutions, uh, developing new strategies and policies. These new skills and capacities are often invisible. They're not seen by visitors, they're not seen as a legacy because it is so much easier to recognize the physical legacy of a stadium than the work and skill legacy that the population has gained. One positive benefit could be if the host city or country gains a mindset of skill development. It focuses more attention on the quality and skill level of the workforce. Once new skills are acquired, they can be used for other projects, other events. But another question can be, if skills are developed locally, will those skilled workers have to leave to find work? Or will a lot of the skilled tasks undertaken for a mega event be conducted by globally operating consultants who move from event to event, leaving little skill capacity behind once an event is over? One often forgotten element is volunteering. Often mega events engage thousands of volunteers to help greet, direct traffic, direct the flow of people, to answer questions. This requires the organization of non-government organizations that play a supporting role. Another perspective on volunteering, though, is the organized opposition, that a mega event that has a negative social impact in some areas may, in fact, prompt the creation of organizations to oppose the event. These organizations gain skills both for the event and to oppose the event. And the question can be raised once organizations are created to protest or support, can they be maintained after the event? And can all of the energy put into volunteering organizations for an event be redirected to other social or economic needs after the event ends. Another legacy is, is the social legacy of what people see and think about a country, a host or an event. We can ask ourselves now after several weeks of Brazil's hosting of the World Cup whether the perceptions of the host city and country have been improved or not improved by the World Cup. It's worth looking at how a media reports the event to also look at divergent views. Is there one single view of the World Cup in Brazil? Or are there many different divergent views? Which views gain prominence, which are most recognized? It's also important to recognize the growing role of social media, uh, both to report joy or disappointment, but also to profess hate or prejudice or discrimination. Uh, looking at social media, you find both positive outlets of expression, but also the use of social media to show hatred against teams and players and countries. The targets of these are often FIFA, the World Cup itself, or Brazil. Another social element is the growth of social media as a way to experience a game. The Brazil-Germany game created two Twitter records. First, almost 36 million tweets during the game itself and a record 58,000 tweets per minute during the fifth goal by Germany. It's interesting that you can track people's attention through Twitter, 
with a dramatic drop off of tweeting during penalty kicks and the result of those kicks leading to a surge of Twitter activity. Another social legacy is the focus on working conditions that's come through the World Cup. Uh, worker conditions were raised as an issue for both Brazil and plans for Qatar as host of the 2022 World Cup. The condition under which workers create the stadiums and the infrastructure is rightly a concern for many as World Cup preparations demand a lot of labour and also raise issues of how those workers are treated. One of the goals of this course is for us to think more deeply about mega events in the World Cup. And one way we can do this is to think about the people that build and make a mega event work. Who builds the stadiums? Who builds the transit systems? How do they work? How are they treated? What type of working conditions do they face? Another example of thinking more deeply is to think about the Brazuca soccer ball in itself, uh, which was a Adidas German invention uh, that was subcontracted to Taiwan, which was unable to fulfill the contract. It was then moved to production in Pakistan. In this case, the issue is not so much worker conditions, which are recognized as being good for the workers in the Pakistani factory that makes the World Cup soccer ball. But I think the irony in this case is that most of the work is done by women, uh, but those women have probably never had the opportunity to play soccer uh, because in their culture it is not widely allowed for women to participate in sports or organized sports at all. This is just another example of looking below the surface of a World Cup to think a little more about the meaning and significance of each dimension of the mega event. So looking overall, we often find that legacy plans uh, are not considered deeply, that the short-term need for the mega event, the imperative that the event has to be served, uh, overwhelms the plans of what happens afterwards. But it's always important to plan on the legacy as part of the process. Given the high cost, the heavy investments of a mega event, then thoughtful legacy is needed to justify the investment. Many host cities don't gain great benefits from hosting a mega event, and the benefits they do gain come from the legacies that remain afterwards. From a planning perspective, then, the ideal is to see the mega event not as an end, where once the event is over, the, the goal has been reached, but really to use the event to make a better city. The mega event is a means to an end. In the end is a better urban environment, better living conditions for the host country and the residents of the host city. So what's next? Uh, keep in touch with us online via our website, megaeventplanning.org. Um, keep track of us through Facebook at Mega Event Planning. If you're interested in academic credit for the planning of mega events, Michigan State University's School of Planning, Design and Construction offers an online four credit course, PDC 491, which addresses the planning issues of mega events in great detail. On the agenda for next year, keep in mind that we have mega events inside the World's Fair when Milan, Italy hosts Expo 2015 as the next global mega event. We appreciate you joining us for this MOOC and hope you've enjoyed it and learned something about what it's like to be inside the World Cup. Thank you.